And here she is, my new friend. I feel like I've known her forever. Erin Sky Kelly's here. How are you? I feel that way too, Joe. You just have that like that type of personality where you're everybody's friend. I think you do. I think you do. And and you are friends with some really cool people. Like you yeah. travel with Tony Robbins. You've been on. You and I had a discussion about our mutual friend Phil Town. You've well, no, we had a discussion about our mutual love of Melissa Town. We think Phil's pretty cool. <laughs> But Melissa Town is like the greatest human who ever humaned. The fact that we she puts up with Phil is like a <laughs> testament to Melissa Town. Listen, she that woman is genius. She is like you talk about Phil's amazing and in, in, you know investment advice and business advice. He's really smart, but she does all of that as well and helps run the business. So I kind of feel like she's the you know she's the gold star there in that relationship. And the fact that everybody's heard of him and nobody's heard of her. Yes. But we know the puppet master. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. That whole family is so talented. Yeah. You, you, I want to start off with this because I had a coach tell me this long, long, long time ago, and I haven't heard it again until your book. And you talk about this big difference between urgent and important very early on. And I'd love to start there because I think this is such a great way to start off 2022, right? Let's make 2022 yes. the year of important, not urgent. Talk yeah. about that for a moment. Oh my gosh. I think because I watched so many people when the pandemic initially hit, just run around like chickens without heads. Like it was, there was just madness for a long period of time. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what's happening with people financially. Most of the time, we just now have sort of a microscope on anything. So it's it it was interesting to me to see how people who are focused on urgent things, like sort of the panic situation, they were panic buying toilet paper. They were, you know, stockpiling, you know, things that they didn't need. They were like completely unprepared for what mattered. And they were fighting with each other on the internet. That was the other thing that they were doing. Right. Whereas people who were focused on what's important, they were really like checking in with like, how's grandma doing in that home? Like, do we have the capacity to move her into our place during this pandemic? What is the health protocols our family's going to follow to make sure that, you know, we're eating properly and going for walks and spending time together and doing puzzles or, you know, that kind of a thing. And it was such a microcosm for how, how sort of we had gotten it wrong for so many years prior to the pandemic. We've been so focused on you know, get things now, hurry now, but like the sale is running out You're, you know, if you don't act now, we're not going to throw in this free toaster. Like we were just consuming, consuming, consuming. And it showed up in our financial picture because when that pandemic hit, people were hurting financially because they had been so focused always on what was urgent and what felt urgent versus what actually mattered in the big picture. I want to know who was the coach that told you that years ago? It, it, it was, I was working for American Express and it was a gentleman named Chris Klinky, who, by the way, was also the reason why I left American Express. He, oh. he, he did this thing where he wrote a letter giving two weeks notice and people don't do this, by the way, in, in our business, they leave at midnight with the client files like Jerry <laughs> Maguire. And then everybody's <laughs> calling to try to get the client. He, yeah. <laughs> he instead did this whole thing where he said, I have other mountains to climb, which is another phrase I use all the time. Cause he wasn't kidding, Aaron. He actually went and climbed Everest twice. Most of the, the major peaks around the, 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 the world. And now he runs an adventure travel company. Like wow. he's totally done something different, which is the whole reason I'm talking to you today is because I reached, 40 and said, you know what? I like this. I don't love it. I have other mountains, I think. So we got to, we got to go. But he was the guy that was cool. like, if I was chasing urgent, I would always be chasing just the next dollar. Yes. And, it, and I think this is so important, especially with people getting out of debt, because to your point, if we're chasing the next sale, we're chasing the next thing. You're like, I'll get out of debt later. I have to put this on a credit card. Cause if I don't do this now, I'm going to miss this opportunity. Right? Yes. Yes. Which is very effective if you're a business owner, right? But it's right. It's, right. Play it's that up debt. if you've got a business because people get sucked into debt because of it. Right, right. But terrible, terrible financial decision as a consumer. Yes. Everyone <laughs> has has a low point. Um, and I've heard so many uh just sad low points and people are like things things really have to change. And 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 you had a low point yourself. You're yes. headed out to meet a client. You head out to meet a client. Tell me that story about where your own journey began. 
Well, you know, I had been part of the urgent part of society for so long. And I was, I was really young when I started buying real estate, I was a teenager. Cause I, you know, I sort of decided that I worked in media, but my grandfather gave me this really good advice that was like, listen, one day you're going to be fat and ugly and no man is going to put you on TV. Now this was in the nineties wow. when wow. men, I know he, he meant it in a kind way, as crazy as that sounds, but like, you know, back then we had, you know, middle-aged white males were running the media. And he was really like, if you, if you leave this up to somebody else's decision, they're just going to choose somebody younger and prettier later. Right. So, so he meant, well, what he meant was don't leave your career in the hands of someone else. So I started buying real estate really young, but I really didn't understand fully what an asset versus a liability was. And so I had all of these, you know, in air quotes, assets, but they weren't necessarily producing cash flow. And I was really doing that leveraging thing where I was just leveraged way too high for the amount of cash that was coming in. And I got to this point where like, I, like, I couldn't figure out how did I have all this money like on paper, but why was I so broke? And I hit this point where like, I had no groceries in the cupboard, like no, like means to kind of get around. And I went to go meet somebody to do a deal. And I started my car and I had no gas in it. And I was like, I can't even go across town to do a deal in order to make, like, I am so broke and I have no room on any card or line of credit or anything. Like you get to the, I was just and I, it, at that point was when I decided to really take a hard look at like what was actually happening and added up all my liabilities and really started to, you know, really made the decision at that point to change the way, I, change my relationship with money, essentially. You're so graphic about it in the book. You talk about how you, you were even making up excuses about why you were going to drink water because you yeah, just needed I'm, to hydrate more. That's right. And, and, and you had like, you thought enough money on a gift card that you could buy them a drink. Yes. And you made sure it was at a time that it wasn't lunch. Like you had this whole story. Oh, because I was, that's what happens when you try and keep up with the Joneses, right? You're wearing this mask and you're lying to not only yourself, but everybody else about like what you're, I couldn't look broke because I wasn't in a position, you know, I had all this property. I had all of the, you know, I had these means. And so I was like trying to figure out how, how was I going to like buy this person a coffee even like, I can't, I definitely can't take them for lunch. Like it, it just sort of all started to happen so fast. And I remember like being like, now I have to lie to get out of this meeting because I'm so embarrassed about my financial situation. So I pretended I had diarrhea because I was like, <laughs> for some reason that seemed less embarrassing than being like, I can't, I don't have any gas in my car. <laughs> I feel, I feel bad saying this, that I laugh so hard because I should not be laughing. I'm like, this is so mean, but the fact that diarrhea, and by the way, just the fact that you go, okay, I've got 50 million excuses and diarrhea is the one you went with. Listen, nobody's going to argue with diarrhea, right? They don't even want you to show up if you've got diarrhea. So I just think like, uh, that was the moment where I was like, wow, now I'm lying. Like now this just everything in my, this feels so gross and I can't, I just can't live this way anymore. And so that was like the the sort of turning point. It wasn't an easy, like, I'd love to say, oh, I just quickly turned the ship around and missed the iceberg, but that's not what happened. Like I still had to hit the iceberg and deal with a few casualties along the way. But isn't um, that the case though, with so many people, yes. you got to talk to a ton of people in your community. It's the way it always happens. You have to hit the iceberg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that was mine. I was excited, Aaron, that, that you also began not just with your own story, which I know for a lot of people is hard to tell. I mean, not just diarrhea, but, but, but just, just the struggle uh, that you had at the time and that you felt so broke and so alone. Like I felt like I was there in that moment, but you also started as a get out of debt expert, not with the things you should do, but with the things we're not going to do. There were two things. Number one, we will not consolidate debt. Why don't you begin where every commercial on television begins with, hey, Aaron, let's just consolidate this and, and take care of it. You know, the thing of, about being in the financial industry for so long, like I was a licensed mortgage broker, owned my own mortgage brokerage for a long period of time. And I can tell you throughout the decades of doing that work that I have never once ever, and listen, if you are the rare exception, I want to hear from you because you're a unicorn, but I have never once heard from anybody who did that and was better off financially. Mm. So we know it doesn't work because what happens, you know, when you, when you really get into numbers and understanding numbers and you do your net worth spreadsheet, 
and you look at, okay, I've got, you know, $30,000 in debt made up of these, you know, six or seven cards, let's say, and now I'm going to consolidate that into one loan. And I put it on my network spreadsheet. You're no different than you were before. You're in the exact same position, except now your, your interest is compounded differently, or it's amortized over a longer period of time. So even though it might feel like you're paying less, you're actually paying more because the part that we keep forgetting is these businesses are not in it to consolidate our debt for us as a favor. They're in it to make money. So it has to be profitable for them. And so the more you keep sort of thinking that the consolidation is going to be the answer, the more you're just deluding yourself or, or missing the point of how money actually works. And instead, if you can understand, like, listen, this is, this is a mindset thing. This is like, absolutely. There's a little bit of math involved, of course, but the behavior part is the part that you have to master, not the consolidation part. When you can get that part under control, then it doesn't matter if you have seven credit cards or 17 credit cards or one, you're going to be able to start to handle money and and pay things down in a way that's actually to benefit of you and not a consolidation company. You talk a, a lot about behavior, but what's the most important like mindset shift to, to getting yourself out of debt? What's the, what's the like one guiding principle maybe that you have when somebody starts off on this journey? Oh my gosh. Okay. So the tricky part about that is I think first you have to really just believe that you can, because we've just been set up or conditioned to really believe that debt is normal. It's here to stay. It's, you know, you have to have it in order to have good credit. And we're, we're playing that credit system, you know, like as if it's the thing that makes us like, we're all hunting for that really great credit score. So we can feel good about ourselves. We forget that that credit score is a moving, breathing number that doesn't stay static. And it's based on just sort of what we've, how we've behaved in the past, not how smart we are. And so people often think like, oh gosh, I just have so much debt. I have so much debt. I have to go to an expert or I have to go to the bank or I have to go you know, outside of myself to figure out how to manage it. And if instead you can just understand literally like, I don't know if you can tell this, Joe, but I'm kind of an idiot. Like I'm only medium smart and I figured it out. And so it's like, you can figure it out. Like it's not, it's it, sometimes the financial industry makes it complicated and it makes it complicated so that then you're reliant on the financial experts in the industry to then sell you things. When in actuality, when you understand money, not only just how money works, but how you interact with money, because how you interact with money, Joe, is going to be different than how I do it. It's going to be different how, than how Ramit does it, than how Dave does it. It's going to be different than how anybody out there does it. So you have to really understand. The Dave, only, the Dave, the, in all, the in Dave, all caps, in the all Dave, caps. All cap, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's going to be like, you have to understand not only how it works, but how you interface with it. And then when you can master that part, that's really where it starts to really work in your favor. Second thing you say that you will not do, you won't be cashing in investments to pay down your debt. Oh my gosh. I did this so many times. Like I, <laughs> if you tell me not to touch the hot stove, I'm going to touch it anyway. Cause I'm going to be like, really? Like, let me, let me see for myself. Like I'll just bang my head against the wall until I'm tired of it. Not till you Oh wow. That is hot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I fell into the cycle for a long period of time and then noticed it with a lot of clients and friends and stuff too, where, you know, if you get into that cycle where you're you know, using investments to pay off debt. I understand the math behind it. Cause sometimes people will look at something and say, you know, this is only earning me 8%, but my credit card is costing me 19%, but it's, we're not looking at how that interest is compounded. So we're not actually looking at apples to apples there. We're not comparing the same thing. And when you get in that habit of like paying stuff off in one fell swoop, you're, you're missing out on those money muscles that it takes to get out of debt in the first place, but then also to build those investment muscles, which you really need for the long term. And as it turns out, they're the same muscles. So what I have everybody do is like, just for, if I, I'm open to being wrong, like maybe there's one person out there that can do this and make this work. I've not seen it in all of my years with the thousands of people I've interfaced with, but if you can not touch those investments and you do the work of getting the hell out of debt within, you know, 12 to 18 months and I'm wrong, then go ahead and take the money out and, and pay it off. But in the meantime, just leave it alone. Try not to try to let it compound, let it do its thing over there, the investments. Let's work on the finer details of the debt and the money over here in the cash flow situation. And then if you get out of debt, now we can just continue to build on what you've already built with those investments. And so I've seen that time and time again. And I did a you know recent podcast with a gal named Leanne who paid off over hundred thousand dollars in consumer debt. Wow. She had this massive um, investment because she worked for a company that, you know, did um, investment matching and stuff like that for her. Yeah. 
And I said to her, please, 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 please. I was like practically begging her, do not, please don't cash it out. She's like, yes, but I could be debt free next week. I'm like, no, 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 please. It's worth it, worth it, worth it. And she's on her way to being a millionaire within a very short period of time because she mastered that money. She's now maxed out all of her investment contributions year after year. And now she's doing other types of investing because she did not touch it. She built those money muscles and now she's using those same money muscles to, to build those investments even further. I love that. She gets done with, well, yeah, she gets done with one Aaron and she's got just a ton of momentum already. Yes. Yes. It feels so good when you finish paying off that debt and you're not at zero. Yeah. Positive net worth. And we'll get back to that. You have three phases. We're really in a lot of ways talking through phase one, which is getting Mm -hmm. yourself in the, in the right spot, but just briefly the three phases of getting your debt paid off. What are those? Well, the phase one is basically just, that's the financial fundamentals and really understanding how money works and how you work with money. Phase two is actually paying off the debt. I don't care how you do it. I give you, you know, there's four different kinds of systems in the world that are popular and I let you choose for you, which one's best for you. But phase two is really where you're actively paying down your consumer debt. And phase three is then when you take everything you learn in phase one and two, and you use those same techniques to then build wealth. And phase three, like she did, like that woman did. Yeah. Like Leanne. Yeah. And so that just, you're in phase three technically for the rest of your life, but that's where you can, you know, learn and expand it it, just like how you chose to pay off debt, how you choose to invest will be, you know, up to your own interests and your personality. And, but at least you'll have a strong understanding of how money and compounding work. Yeah. It's, it's so powerful because The reason when I was a financial planner, which has been a long time, but I don't think people have changed. And based on questions we get to the show, I don't see people change. The the problem isn't the strategy. And I love that you have all kinds of different, you know, uh, uh, ways for people to handle debt. The problem is you blow yourself up. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you spend so much time making sure that you're actually ready to do this journey ahead of time because it gets so frustrating seeing people just get partway into their strategy They're You've seen this. They're great for three or four months. And then they go, man, we, we reached our first milestone. Let's go celebrate with a big screen TV. Yes. <laughs> and then we get right back into debt and we do it again. Yes. Yeah. It's like the same with those, like whatever those diets were, you know, where you had to like eat the grapefruit and the cayenne <laughs> pepper lemon water for three months. Like you can't sustain that for a long right. period of time. You and really will fun. have diarrhea. It's not worth it. <laughs> And it's funny that you say that because Angelo Poli, who our listeners know very well from MetPro, who's on quite a bit talking about healthy living, also talks about the grapefruit diet or whatever it is. Your body also doesn't respond to it after a while. And I think it's the same thing with that plan. Your body goes, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not believing this anymore. You just kind of, all right, you've got 10 keys when you're first getting started. And I think this is great for our debt payoff week and our, hey, let's hit the ground running week. So I'm going to, I'm going to say these 10 Mm -hmm. and you give me the first thing that comes up, your very first thought from your 10 in the book. Number one, pretend you know nothing. Oh gosh. If you think to yourself, I know that you're, you're judging yourself and you're blocking off any future learning. And one of the things that I've learned from, you know, people like Tony Robbins or people out there who are out there killing in life, they take notes all the time, even if they know something or they're hearing it differently, like try and figure out not do I know this already, but what can I learn from this? It'll change everything financially. I love that. The growth mentality there. Second is no shooting. Oh, that is the biggest swear word. It's so full of judgment. Oh, I hate that word. I'll, you know, I say a lot of really, I'm from a small town. I have a very horrible mouth. Um, but the word that I hate the most is should, because as soon as you should on somebody, you know, you tell somebody, oh, you should do this, or maybe you should downsize, or maybe you should, it's laced with judgment and it puts you in a different position from somebody else. And it doesn't really allow them to fully explore what it is they need to do. So instead, if you do have something that you want to share with somebody financially, what might work is if you say, here's what worked in my experience. And you share from that perspective, that also will really help you learn and grow. You know, I think, I think when you were upstairs, I hope you told mom that no more should like Joe and OG should get on my basement. Do do not should on us. (laughs) That's right. No, we belong here. Uh, Number three, feel your feelings fully. I think this is a big one because we, man, when I read this, we repress it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think oftentimes the drivers behind our financial behaviors are how we feel about things. We, when we're in our logical part of our brain, we're like, oh yes, of course I'm going to budget. Of course. But then, you know, it's like middle of the month, you're tired. You don't feel like cooking, right? You make a, you make a emotional decision. So I think it's important to feel those feelings rather than cut them off and accept that they're going to happen, but then act in spite of how you feel. 
which, which by the way, is, is the next, is the next <laughs> one. Do not let emotions dictate your behavior. Right. I, you know what? I was so lucky. I grew up with all brothers because, um, you know, when I was a teenager and, and PMS hit, I feel like we're getting really into analysis TMI, but like, I noticed that they weren't crazy once a month, right? Like they, they seem to like be pretty level-headed all the time. And so I, I quickly learned that like, wow, like I'm letting my emotions run the show here and that's not healthy for me or anybody I'm around. And so I learned how, and I talk about it a little bit in the book, but I learned how to really master or understand how to manage in spite of how you feel. It, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard so many times, well, personal finance is personal and I feel better doing this. And, and, and while I do agree that personal finance is personal, I still sometimes hear and go, no, no, it still is. That's a bad course. That's there are some basics. Right. There are some basics yeah. that you have to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Next up is approach everything with grace. Mm -hmm. You got to be Who? really kind to yourself. Oh, I thought you meant, I'm like, I got to get a friend named Grace. <laughs> Grace. I don't know Grace. Grace is amazing. She's a multimillionaire. But you <laughs> just approach everything with her. She'll help Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Yeah. We're so hard on ourselves, right? Especially when we screw up and we are going to screw up. Like I now think of myself as pretty darn smart with money. And when the pandemic hit, I started ordering my groceries. I accidentally ordered a case of honey instead of a jar of honey. And so like, you're still going to make mistakes, right? But I just gave it to all my neighbors. And I'm like, how can I make this into a good thing? Right. I was so going to say, now I know what I'm getting for the holidays. <laughs> if I get, if I get honey for my friend, Aaron. That's right. Now you'll know why. <laughs> I get four, four things of honey. For, for, right. for it. Uh, next up is be willing to get uncomfortable. Yeah. I will let you know this, right. You've had to do it too. Whenever you are going to make a change or you're going to like go after a really big goal, like you want to be debt free for life and live debt free and start to build wealth. Like it's going to require you to be uncomfortable because even though how you're living now might be stressful, you're used to it. So yeah. sometimes being uncomfortable is being used to being a, you know, somebody who makes great money decisions. I, I, I love that advice. And as you know, from having been through your whole journey, it's so, so hard, mm -hmm. which is the next one. Stay in your lane. Oh man. You know, I see parents do this with grown children, even still where somebody's going to make a financial decision and then somebody just swerves right out of their lane and, and tells them what to do. And you really have to let people make mistakes. I think it's really critical also to teach children from a young age about money and let them make money mistakes when they are living under your roof. Because if we don't allow children to manage money or, tr you know, be trustworthy with money when they're young, then they are going to make those mistakes in their twenties and thirties. And it's so much more difficult to overcome when they're older. So really staying in your own lane is about like, focus on your own finances before you worry about how somebody else is spending or how somebody else is managing and set goals based on you and where you're at and really put the blinders on and don't concern yourself with how other people are doing. It's so disappointing. It's so much more fun to just complain about other people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problems. I want to, I want to complain about everybody else's some strangers problems. It's true. What you resist persists. Oh man. That's Carl Jung. That said that. Okay. So this is what I've learned is sometimes when you're like, if you're chasing money, like if you're um, if you're going after something really hard and it's not working, you have to pull back and let go because sometimes I don't know what the right word is. I'm not very woo woo, but like, it's a little bit like the universe is trying to put you in a different direction, right? Sometimes yeah. when something feels really hard and it's not going the way you want it to go, it's a clear sign that you need to back off and, and allow things to shift so that things can, you know, because money is, it's like dating, right? Like if you, if you're interested in somebody and you like pursue them with that state of desperation, they're going to run like money is going to run from you. <laughs> Whereas if instead you focus on you and you stay healthy and um, happy, you can attract money. You can attract the things that you want. And so there's a, you know, sometimes resisting things is just going to cause that problem to stay longer instead of surrendering or finding a solution around it, which is the easier way to go. It is so true. The last two on these, by the way, are in, and this is my opinion, are the two most powerful. Uh, and I think that this next one, Aaron, is any success that I've had in life. A lot of it's just attributed to this. And you say just two words, show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think with finance now, this is where it's like, you know, this is a little bit of 
me in the story, but like I grew up believing this is so embarrassing to admit to you. We've, we've already been there. We've already been there. I really believed that like, I was going to marry somebody who was going to take care of me. I believed it was like my, like everything would be fine as long as I could be rescued. So there was always a part of me that thought somebody else was going to rescue me. Like the bank would step in and I'd be able to consolidate or I would get a better job or something outside of me would help rescue me from my financial issues. And instead, when I learned like what I was doing then is I was really like, I wasn't showing up fully. I wasn't showing up for me when I believed that something external was going to save me. And instead, when I showed up, even when it was hard, even when it was difficult, even when it was embarrassing, you know, having hard conversations or, or doing the difficult thing was the thing that I needed to do in order for things to then become easy. And so showing up, even when you don't feel like it is absolutely critical. It's like people who um, you know, they sign up for a course, let's say, or they, you know, they start and they, they do the first couple lessons, and then it gets hard and they make excuses, right? Like, oh, I'm going to take yoga. And then the fourth yoga lesson, they start dropping out and then they quit just showing up, even though you feel you like wanna... you're looking at me when you say that, are Listen, you man, we've are all you... laid on the floor in the hot yoga studio and cried. Okay. We've all, <laughs> it's fine. It's safe, but like just going sometimes is the thing that you need to break the pattern. Yeah. So showing up is absolutely critical. Yes. So, so much success when you're just in the room, even if it's virtually, yes. if you're in the room. Yes. And the last one, I think the one that especially people who are uber successful for short periods of time, forget, maintain an impeccable standard of self-care. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I think, again, that helps with the emotional part we were talking about earlier. When you are rested, when you're well-fed, when you've, um, you know, taking care of some of the basics. Like we, we forget that budgeting and doing your net worth is self-care. That's a form of self-care. So when you're, when you're doing that consistently, then what happens is you're able to perform at a higher level. When you're hangry, for example, you're making maybe decisions that aren't healthy for anybody. Like you're, you're snapping at people that you love, you're creating drama, you're, you know, you're part of something that's, that's not whole and healthy. And so having an impeccable standard of self-care, whatever that means for you, everybody's got something different, right? I, I have a whole chapter on this in the book that is different than how most people describe self-care. Self-care for me is not, you know, about the ice cream or right. even about resting. It's about like, what is the thing that I need to do to get myself to the next place that I want to be so that I can feel proud of myself when I fall asleep? Like, what is that? And usually it's not some big thing. Usually it's just a very tiny thing done consistently, but maintaining that level for yourself, like making that the priority over everything else is the thing that anchors you back to what's important in life. And it helps you avoid all of those urgent things that go off. Cause you'll realize that, oh, this is just, this is just the next siren. This is just the next news cycle. This is just the next clickbait and I'm not going to be a part of it. I want to dive into a couple of tactics before we go. And I think by the way, um, uh, stackers that the fact that we're talking about tactics, this, this late in this discussion shows you how important this mindset is and how, how, how much we forget that and why we, we lose because I think of all the things Aaron, you said earlier, not because we don't have the right tactic. Um, but, and, and don't get me wrong. Tactics are important and sticking with your game plan is important, but you're not going to stick with it. If you don't do the things that we already talked about net worth and budgeting are, are, are the two tools you say you need. We have all, I love toys. I love, I love the, the, the apps on my phone. I dig them all. Um, I think that's fun, but you're like, listen, you need two things. You need net worth statement and a budget. Yeah. Number one, why net worth before the budget? Why not? But oh doesn't budget lead to net worth. Like, why do you have them in that, that order? First of all, budgets suck. Let's just admit that everybody hates them. We all hate them. They suck. So if you start with that, you're setting yourself up for like that big old depression, like, oh, this is never going to work. But, and that's exactly where everybody starts. That's where everybody starts. But if you start with net worth, you can actually figure out where it is you are. Like, you know, that old analogy, I, I don't, can't remember who said it first. It's so old. I'm sure every personal development coach in the world has said it. It's but probably you. If you want to get to Paris, if I say, Joe, I'm going to send you to Paris. Um, like, and then you're like, wow, that's amazing. And then I hang up the phone. You're not getting to Paris because I don't know where you are today. I don't know where in the world. I mean, now I know you're in Texas, right? But I, if I don't find that out, if I'm like, Joe, pinpoint me where you're at today, I can't send you to Paris because I, I buy you a ticket from Morocco to Paris. You're not going to get there. So the net worth really is the, is the guidepost that tells you like what is actually happening. It's like the truth slayer. It's like, this is, this is where, this is what it looks like now. 
But the budget's job, the only job of the budget is to increase the net worth. So whether you have debt or whether you're building wealth, the budget's job is to increase the net worth. So you can't really give the budget a job. You don't know what it's supposed to do if we don't have a record of the net worth first. And the other thing that's really critical about a budget that I think nobody talks about is that nobody in the history of ever has ever gotten a budget perfectly. Like, have you ever budgeted and it started the month and then it turned out exactly as you planned at the end of the month? <laughs> no. no. And we no. never talk about that. We never talk about that. And I finally figured out, gosh, if I even get it right 80% of the time, I am killing it financially. But if I don't have a budget, if I don't have a goalpost to even kick at to begin with, like I'm not going to get there. And so understanding that this budget that you're going to make isn't going to be perfect, but its entire job is just to increase the net worth, whether that means paying down liabilities if you've got debt or increasing and in purchasing assets if you're, if you're building wealth. If, if we just understand that all you have to do with that budget is figure out how to make that happen, just squeeze out a couple of things to either pay down that debt or increase that net worth, then you're laughing. So then it's not about the budget being perfect ever. And it's not about an app or it's not about the, although there are some great apps out there. It's not about any of that. It just becomes about that, you know, increasing that net worth to really get you that, you know, sort of financial wholeness or financial freedom that you're looking for. I think the um, a very important thing that you that you discuss is it's important to stick with it, right? To stick with mm -hmm. the budget, and as you know, it gets so difficult to do that, Aaron. And you have another hilarious story about uh, about dating a guy who's a ten on the on the well. He's, it sounds like he's like a twelve on the one to ten meter for you. And uh, his name was Corey Horton. This was a I can still smell him when you when we talk about him. I can remember what he smells like. Wait a minute, Corey Horton. Did he smell like donuts? Is he like Tim's kid? <laughs> is that is that what he is? No. No, he smelled like musk and like cheap drugstore cologne. But it was fantastic. I was young, you know. I fell for anything then. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, tell me how this translates to budgets. Well, you know, I think the thing, you know, I'm joking around in the book about how like when you don't have a plan, you make terrible decisions. And so Corey Horton was a guy that like broke my heart. You know, he said he was going to call and he didn't. And, you know, he was like kind of a player and, um, very, very handsome. If I mentioned that, I don't know if I've mentioned that he was like, you know, you I don't know if you mentioned a that lot. at all. You can get away with a lot when you're handsome. And what I realized soon is I had to have a plan for when I would run into Corey Horton. Cause otherwise I'd make the worst decisions. And so the budget is a lot like, you know, making a plan to avoid your Corey Hortons. The budget is the thing that like, no matter how you're feeling or no matter, you know, if you're, if you're smelling his sweatshirt at three o'clock in the morning while he's out with another woman, you know what I mean? Like you're going to make the right decisions for your money. You're not going to fall into the trap. And so it's really critical that like, you understand that the budget is basically just a boundary. It's saying, Hey, here's my financial goal. Whether that be like, you know, you want to max out your 401k or your, you know, whatever, take your family to Disney world for the week, whatever the financial goal is, the budget is just the boundary for that. So it doesn't have to be strict or firm. It just has to be the thing that protects you from the Corey Horton decision you're about to make. Yeah. Mine is the Tim Horton decision. Yes. The Tim Horton. That, that's, that, that's mine. And that's not good self-care either, but it's, it's, it's but it tastes good. Sometimes, sometimes eating my feelings is that's right. Absolutely. Feels great in the moment. And by the way, to your point too, you said that, you know, Corey Horton would also sometimes lead to something called a frozen Chicago, which oh, yeah. also doesn't sound like that was good either. I mean, it was great in the moment, but not good. That's right. Frozen Chicago is a blender drink. They used to sell it at Jack Astor's. I don't know if it still exists, but it was like some crazy combination of ice cream, Kahlua or something. It was like oh. some kind of like, it was amazing. And it was terrible to sit, right? But it's, again, I didn't have a plan for those things. And so I was always just choosing to make myself feel better over doing the thing that would make me feel good in the long term. Which is funny because, you know, I mean, those shopping sprees over the short term, you feel great. Yeah. And it's only the next day, the regret that you have, that horrible, yes. like the horrible regret. One, one, one quick more, gosh, I have, I've got two, but, uh, and they're both quick. You did a podcast recently on planning with others. And, and by the way, we will link to this in the show notes because this is super important. If you plan with other people, but just a guideline, how is this different if you're planning with someone else? You're talking about like a partner situation? Yes. Like yeah, if you're, sure. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, first and foremost, we never marry somebody who has the same financial, you know, blueprint as we have, which makes life fun and spicy. But I think it's absolutely critical that you have what's called a naked budget meeting, meaning you can go ahead and get naked because then both people are probably going to show up to the budget meeting. But most importantly, it's like where you really lay out why you want the things financially that you want. Because 
when one partner is a spender, one partner is a saver, let's say the, the saver can really bring a lot of shame on the spender, but it's really critical to understand why the saver wants the spender to rein it in. Like if it comes down to like, Hey, I, I don't feel safe. Like that. We're going to make, you know, that we're going to have a retirement that feels safe to me. Or if it's like, I'm just worried that you're not prioritizing the family or something like that. Those conversations have to be had. And we outline a really great, you know, series of questions to have those um, conversations together. But I think it's really important to understand, like your partner is going to be wrong about money hundred percent of the time, and you are going to be wrong to them hundred percent of the time. So the, the key is to really figure out like, where is that common ground and start there, start with a relationship vision financially together. What are we working for? Why are we spending all this time in our careers and our jobs? Like, what is the point of this at the end of this? And how are we going to work together so that, you know, this, this, and you know, you're talking earlier about like shopping and that dopamine hit, you can get that same dopamine hit buying assets that you can it, it, as the spender. So there are ways to flip that narrative so that it actually works for you instead of against you, but you have to, you got to talk, you got to figure it out together. And that, that talking to me is the most powerful budget. Like that is the most, part, because then you, if you have the scheduled talking, then you're going to have these organic conversations, you know, that spring yes. from that. And, and that's, that to me is where the magic happens. The book yeah. is called get the hell out of debt, the proven three-step method that will radically shift your relationship to money. I, I have never read a book that does such a great job of the mindset, which is why we screw up. And I think especially this first week of January, this mindset is so important. And I'm assuming Aaron, we can get this everywhere, right? Yeah, it's available everywhere. And uh, uh, I know you said this elsewhere. You like the small bookstores like we do. So if you yes, I love, please, please support your small independent booksellers because they're, you know, they work extra hard and it, you know, for the extra 50 cents, it's going to cost you to buy a book there. You really are putting food on somebody else's table. And I think that that's a really important thing we can do, especially in the month of January. And we're losing these great play. I mean, let's make it more selfish. Oh, yours, yes. yours is great, but to make it more <laughs> selfish, we're losing these places that are the world's best hangouts. They're the they best are. place to go and all oh, that book smell and just hanging yes. out with all these ideas and it's gone. It's going away. Yes. And they oh. know, they know the books. Like you can ask them a question. They're not just like, here's where it's located, but they can tell you like the flavors and the spices of the different books that come in. And yeah, genius. I was reading a book called Confessions of a Bookseller, which I highly recommend to everybody. It's just a diary, one year of this used bookseller in Scotland. And in, and in one of the chapters, he said, a guy came in today and asked where the self-help section was. And one of us got the irony. <laughs> Okay, I got one. I got one more. One more question, but and this has nothing to do with anything except yeah. I talk to a lot of authors. Uh, I see a lot of covers. Mm -hmm. There is a bicycle on the front cover. Yes. Oh, why? Gosh. Why is there a bicycle on the front cover of your book? Oh gosh. Okay. So I'm known for saying things that are a little outrageous, not on purpose. I just like I I don't really have a filter that's working properly. And this one time, I was speaking at this conference. And I, I came out of the gate, we were talking about, you know, budgeting and net worth and, and somebody raised their hand and said, hey, I fail at it every time. And I, so I just keep quitting. And I said, okay, well, how many of you in the room learn to ride a bike? How many of you know how to ride a bike? And everybody raised their hand. I said, how many of you were really good at it the first time? And then like, you know, nobody raised their hand. I said, that's like me. Like the very first time I rode a bike, I like, hit the curb and banged my crotch and fell over the, you know, and skinned my knee. And then I said, so budgeting and net worth, it's like, we're going to have to bang our crotches a few times before we get this right. And then like, I heard it for the first time and everybody else, you know what I mean? I was like, oh no, I could feel my face go red. Like my, my hands were red. Every part of me was embarrassed. It just came up. So now there's a bike on the cover. <laughs> The, the story behind it is like the very last, I don't even tell it in the book. It's like in the acknowledgement section. It's like the very last acknowledgement in the book. <laughs> so now I've made you read. Like, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. Like, that'll be that. That's the best way to stop is you telling that story. Holy shit. Is that funny? Oh, oh my God. I'm yeah. so glad I asked you that question. I was like, I don't have time for this. We're way over. We've had Nobody asked man. me. We've had the, oh my it's amazing God, that you is asked. that funny? My <laughs> stomach hurts. All right. I'm hitting stop on that one. Happens. <laughs> you have to hit the iceberg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that was mine. All right. Of course, uh, leaf blower guy gets like right here. <laughs> 
I don't know if you hear me hitting the mute. Can you hear the the leaf floor? I can't hear it, but you, I've got a guy in my neighborhood who just bought, he's having a midlife crisis or something. He just bought one of those really loud cars and he just circles around the neighborhood. So every now and then I have to hit the mute button while he drives around, right? And just. <laughs> I feel like there's this, there's this conspiracy between the Leaf Floor Association, the ambulance people <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. Testing just, out they, a random siren. They don't want people to learn about money, Joe. They're they like, listen. <laughs> this guy's a part of the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hold on. It looks like he's got just a couple seconds. <laughs> this is so bad. That's amazing. It's like the universe doesn't want us to talk. Come on, buddy. No, he's thorough. <laughs> Good for him, though. You know what I mean? You can't make could, this crap up. He could be out there doing a half-ass job, but he he's could, committed, Joe. He's, he's, he's the he's, leaf blower you want. He is. <laughs> He's the king, the king of leaf blowers. Oh, here we go. There he is. Just when you thought he couldn't get closer. It now you gonna, hear it. Yeah, no, I can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Steve, you got, you have to leave this in as a blooper at the end. <laughs> this will be fantastic. Different position from somebody else. And it doesn't really allow them to fully explore what it is they need to do. So instead, if you do have something that you want to share with somebody financially, what might work is if you say, here's what worked in my experience and you share from that perspective, that also will really help you learn and grow. Because we, we, we started late and uh, obviously, and uh, so, so Charnay showing up to meet. Uh, <laughs> It keeps them fun. Spicy. You got to admit, you've been on tour for what now? Eight months. This is the weirdest ass interview you've done yet. <laughs> but you know what? I adore you. I always have. And so it is so much fun for me. So I don't care if it's the weird. It's like, she, she's like, he is a nightmare. Yes. No. Yes. I'll be the forward to the next book. <laughs> Honestly, it's, you're so refreshing because you're so casual and real compared to other interviews where they're like, Let's talk oh, about the compounder. You know what I mean? Nobody cares about that. Oh my God. And how many people haven't read your crap at all? And they're, yeah. they're going away and you got to kind of talk them down. You're like, no, I wouldn't go that way. <laughs> no, if you'd read page three, I did not say that. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry.